Welcome back to You're Not Crazy, Gospel Sanity for, for Younger Pastors. Uh, we were going to be looking at 2 Timothy chapter 5 today, then we realised there wasn't a 2 Timothy chapter 5. <laughs> Sam, so um, you're crazy. You're... <laughs> I love that. Uh, but we do have some questions that various folks have sent in, so we're going to tackle them, Ray, see if we have anything to say in response to those. Uh, Crossway, again, are, are giving us such wonderful resources. There's a book called Reactivity by Paul Tripp, um, and we will think about that as well. Again, I'm Ray Ortland with my friend Sam Alberry. We thank every listener for sharing this time with us. We want this to serve you well. Now, we've plowed through 2 Timothy together. We've all gained insights. I feel richer. I feel that 2 Timothy will now be a special book to me as it hasn't been for the rest of my life. Today, right now in this episode, this is a Q&A time and you, our listeners, have sent in questions. We thank you for these. And we have seven questions that we'd like to respond to now in our time together. So, Sam, why don't you lead us through these? Yeah, so the first question was, um, how do you lead a staff team? In terms of building out gospel culture, what what does that in, what should that mean for how you lead a staff team? Hmm. What would your first thought be, Sam? My first thought would be, that's a great question for Ray. <laughs> you've led a staff team. I've not led a staff team. I've led... well people within a staff team, but I've not led a team itself. Well, uh, okay. Just the first thing that comes to my mind is sit in a circle, not in rows Hmm. in front of a guy at a lectern, but democratize the situation. Everybody at the same level, Mm -hmm. everybody seated together around tables or in a circle and a lot of eye contact, laughter, openness, vulnerability, transparency, humility, enjoying the moment. If, as the Shorter Catechism says, uh, man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever, then as Augustine and others have taught us through the years, Hmm. enjoyment is the highest form of love. Hmm. When we come together and enjoy the Lord and enjoy one another and enjoy the ministry, that is love flowing out in the power of the Holy Spirit. So create a democratized, shared experience of enjoying being together and enjoying doing the work of the ministry. It's not just a list of tasks. Yeah. And people are not simply there because of their work capacities. You, people should be feeling valued, esteemed, welcomed. Is it fair to say, Ray, that if, if we're not establishing gospel culture in that part of church life we shouldn't expect to see it anywhere else oh yes because real christianity operates from the inside out hmm. never from the outside in so um we we don't um pose as christians in hopes to become christians at an individual level yeah and in church leadership whatever happens inside the leadership in that inner circle that inner ring of of leadership, influence, planning, praying, and so forth, that properly spreads out with, hopefully, healthy and happy inevitability to yeah. the entire church body and into the community. So you'd want, as, as an evidence of that going well, for staff members to feel like they can walk in the light within, yes. the, st- the, within the staff team. It's an essential uh, mark of authenticity. When people feel they have to always have to bring their A game and they can't risk admitting weakness and failure. Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, if I understand 1 John chapter 1, the problem with that leadership culture is it isn't Christian at all. Mm -hmm. Just because we're doing the Lord's work, so to speak, Mm -hmm. and planning church services, that, that isn't necessarily Christian. Yeah, It's Christian when it's honest and vulnerable and there's a real tenderness going around the circle of leaders yeah that's good um hope that helps um the next question uh talks about imposter syndrome some some listeners may not be familiar with that particular wording but i think almost all of us will be familiar with the concept it's describing which is imposter syndrome is describing the experience of feeling as though everybody else belongs here and i don't and i'm i'm kind of here because someone was was asleep at the switch and they're all going to realize any moment now that I don't fit in, that I don't belong. I don't know what I'm doing here. I can't do this. 
this is going to be the Sunday they, they discover I can't preach, I can't run a staff team, I can't run a church. A lot of people have that in lots of areas of life. Mm. Um, I remember when I when I was first in in Oxford doing ministry to university students there, this was in the very early days of Facebook and social media. Yes, that long ago. I remember someone set up a Facebook group that was called, I got into Oxford by mistake, can I go home now, please? Wow. And just within the first few days of, of term starting up, there were hundreds of, of people in that group. That's that's kind of imposter syndrome. It's common for, for people in Christian ministry to feel that. How do we cope with imposter syndrome? What would you say, Sam? If you've described it so vividly, I think every single one of us understands exactly yeah. what you're talking yeah, about. I might have felt it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think, well, it does, it does help that, that there's even a name for it. it. means I'm not the only one feeling that yeah. way. There's some comfort in that. Um, and hopefully for those who are experiencing it right now, our talking about it is an indication you're not you're not on your own if you're feeling it i think one of the things that has helped me is to keep coming back to who does who does jesus see me as being um how does he see me um and you know there's i think we've seen some of this dynamic in second timothy um there is a there is a grandeur to who Timothy is as a man that Jesus has put his hand upon. Yes. That even, Timothy won't perceive himself. Even in his weaknesses. Yeah. And Timothy's, I'm sure, reading between the lines, there's, there's parts of Timothy that are thinking, I don't know if I should be here. This yeah. this feels too much for me. Um, and so Paul is saying, you know, fan into flame the gift that was given oh, you. You gosh. have believed. Yes. Um, you know, you you are the real deal. Um so part of it is is learning to see ourselves in the light of who we are now in Christ. And a very significant part of that is we we must help each other to see ourselves in that light yeah. and to make sure we're encouraging each other. It reminds me of a story my mom told me once about my dad. He was a, a young pastor at Lake Avenue Church in Pasadena. This was a big church, a lot of significant people. There were faculty from Fuller Seminary who are members of the church. And dad is supposed to preach in that kind of environment, mm. these formidable human beings. And dad was not made of titanium. And so one Sunday night, they had, after, they had a morning and evening service. One Sunday night, dad and mom were there together alone. And dad was saying frankly to her, I talk about imposter syndrome. Dad said in his humility, this church deserves a better preacher than I will ever be. I shouldn't be here. And mom said, well, why don't, we, why don't we turn to Jeremiah chapter 1 and the call of Jeremiah to ministry? So they opened up their Bibles, read Jeremiah chapter 1, and there they read, the Lord stretched out his hand. He put his words in Jeremiah's mouth. And mom had the wisdom to say to dad, your mouth, your giftedness, your eloquence is not really what matters. Whose word is in your mouth, that is what makes the difference. Wow. And that helped dad to keep going and wow. to lay aside this hmm. haunting, paralyzing imposter yeah. syndrome. I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to say, Ray, I think I'm, I would trust a pastor more yes. who has imposter syndrome than one who has never experienced it. Absolutely. If yeah. there's a pastor and it's never occurred, it never occurred to him once to think, am I the right guy for this? Yeah. What am I doing here? Yeah. I'd find it harder to trust such a man. I totally agree. Yeah. So whoever asked that question, I hope, A, there's some, some use in the answer to it, but I hope you just feel encouraged. The fact that you're asking it may be actually a sign of your health. Mm. Um, Ray, in a previous season, we, we were talking about in our preaching, not just wanting to challenge people, um, but instead to sort of gospel people into change rather than to sort of push and elbow them into change and someone has asked do we have any examples of how to do that in any kind of case studies um, where we've we're trying to present christ to people so that they're following him rather than us simply trying to challenge them into changing their behavior or something well, I have so many regrets in this very way, Sam, because although I didn't use the word challenge, for years I preached hundreds of the most wretched sermons imaginable that really were of the nature of challenge. 
as opposed to the nature of promise. Hmm. And I didn't realize it, but I was exercising an old covenant ministry when I could have exercised a new covenant ministry. Challenge is of the nature of law. Promise is of the nature of the gospel. Hmm. And Jesus fulfilled the law for us and sends his Holy Spirit now to fulfill it in us. And these are, this is, this is not a challenge coming at us. It's not pressure. It's mm. not Jesus barking orders. It's Jesus sending the Holy Spirit, having atoned for our sins, sending the Holy Spirit mm. to work in us that which is pleasing in his sight. So when I hear Christians describe preaching and, and even compliment preaching as, oh, that was a great challenging message today, mm. Pastor. I, I feel, I, what a tragedy. I deeply regret it. And here's, Sam, I'm looking at the last two words in the Old Testament, at the end of the book of Malachi, the last two words, utter destruction. That's where the Old Covenant takes us. Because original sin is not going away, and it's not manageable by challenge. Hmm. There's only one remedy for this impasse deep within us, and that is grace, mercy, and promise in Hmm. Christ. Hmm. What are your thoughts? I'm very struck by that. Um, What was I about to say? Yeah, I've I've got an example, Ray, from um, a few months ago. I preached a sermon and had an opportunity to preach it again a few days later and in between those two (laughs) those two occasions I had to redo um a whole section of the sermon because the 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 first time I did it I was trying to challenge people I was just trying to give them stuff to do so the passage uh touched on on Romans 6 verse 13 do not present your members Mm. to sin as instruments for unrighteousness but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. And I preach that as, come on guys, present your, your members now, the parts of your body, to God to be instruments of righteousness. So, you know, what can you do with your hands? What can you do with your eyes? What can you do with your ears? And so on. Um, All of which is, those are great points. Yeah, I mean, it is what the passage is, is talking about doing, but I was teaching it as a kind of grit your teeth, come on guys. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I realised, actually, there's a far more gospel way of, of preaching that because do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness. That was what we used to do. Every single part of my body was being presented to sin as an instrument for unrighteousness. I may not have realized that at the time, but that, that was what was going on. Mm-hmm. Isn't it amazing now that because of what Christ has done, those very parts of the body we have sinned so egregiously with can now be presented to Jesus. And I was talking to a guy recently who um, was struggling because at the time I was chatting to him, he was he was engaged and he was struggling with the fact that he had sexually sinned a huge amount in his past, was now a, a believer, engaged to a wonderful Christian girl wanting to to have a Christ honoring marriage but he struggled to think about how sexual intimacy could be a a sort of a a blessing to their marriage given how much he'd sinned in that area and this this verse came to mind as I was talking with him thinking well that part of the body however much you have used it to sin can now be an instrument for righteousness and I just realized this this is inviting us into something Mm. Not kind of browbeating us into something. And even, Sam, as you're saying that, this awareness washes over me of assurance, privilege, newness of life. Hmm. Um, when that magic starts happening, I know I'm coming under the wonderful spell of the gospel. Yeah, and it's a it's a we get to do something yes. rather than, come on, guys, we have to do something. That's right. We get to offer a, the huge. parts of our body to God now. Yeah, what a privilege. It's insane. So, and I think the trouble is, you, you mentioned when someone uses the sermon was challenging as a compliment. I think it's because it, it flatters our flesh. Mm-hmm. 
because you give me stuff to do and I'm up to it. Yeah. This you know? time I'm going to prove to the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. So I hope that helps. Um, I, I have to, I catch myself frequently now when I'm preparing a sermon because my first draft will be kind of the yes. kind of come on guys, let's, let's <laughs> pull your, you know, and I have to think, no, no how, how is Jesus wooing us? Yeah into living in the way he's calling us to live. That is so true to life because I would start my sermon prep on a Tuesday after having taken Monday off. And and by Thursday, I was finally getting all this moralism sort of out of my system. Yeah. And Friday morning, I would start actually pivoting toward preaching the passage as gospel. Yeah. <laughs> so my goal is, I'm not, I'm not saying I get anywhere near to, you know, reaching this in my sermons, but my goal is that our hearts are now so captivated by Christ that our longing is to do whatever the passage is talking about yes. doing. Yeah. So that's an ongoing um, ongoing battle for myself as I prepare sermons. Um, a, a brother has written asking, how do we cope with anxiety and burnout and wanting to quit? And this, this dear brother is in that very spot yeah. at the time he was sending that email. Um, we all go there, don't we? Yeah. We all understand. And it just so happened, I was so struck by this. I brought my old Bible with me today, and in the back, just inside the back cover, was this piece of paper from May 26th, 1988, when I was tempted to quit ministry. I was so defeated, so disheartened, felt like such a failure. And you know, Sam, I really wasn't very good at it. It wasn't as though I was facing this terrible opposition that was defeating me. I just wasn't very good at pastoral mm. ministry. And I didn't know what to do. But So I, I actually had a typewriter. That's how long ago this was. I took out a piece of paper and I wrote out a prayer, a covenant, mm. a commitment. I, I literally signed on the dotted line, giving this mess over to the Lord. I said, Lord Jesus Christ, Believing that true life is to be found in you alone and obeying your summons to enter the narrow gate and walk the hard path, at the end of which alone true life is to be granted, I sign myself and all I have over to you as best I can in my weakness, earnestly desiring to be found faithful as your disciple and servant at whatever the personal cost. Have mercy upon me, O Lord. Raymond C. Ortland Jr., 26 May, 1988. It's not as though, you know, at that moment the clouds parted and every, the birds began to sing. And But Sam, it was a turning point. Mm -hmm. And a year later, my reality was markedly different. But when I hit rock bottom, mm. the Lord met me there. And hitting rock bottom is not so bad because that's so commonly where Jesus awaits us. Yeah. Yeah, that's wonderful, Ray. Would you put that on Instagram? <laughs> Seriously? Yeah. Okay. I think that would encourage people. All right. I'll do that. Guys, if you, um, you know, social media is one of those things at the moment I'm trying not to touch with a barge pole, but... Uh, Instagram is a slightly friendlier neighborhood mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, Ray is always encouraging. Um, and if you didn't know what Nixie looked like this week, then <laughs> it can help you with that as well. That's right. um, there's a fascinating question. Um, what is the role of church membership in establishing gospel culture? Yeah. What would you say about that, Sam? Well, I've, I've come from a tradition being an Anglican in the UK where we've not really had a formal system of church membership mm. into a church where we do. So it's been interesting to sort of compare and contrast. And I've realized that one of the, one of the aims of the membership process is to, is to invite people into who we are and what we're about as a church. So that there's a kind of a conscious sense of, okay, I am, I am, opting into this mm -hmm. and the flip side of that is you, you you're gently also saying if this isn't if this isn't your vibe if this isn't something you feel you can give your heart to 
there may be another church for you that you would feel more at home in. Um, so the, the membership process, as we as we have it at Emmanuel, is it's an opportunity to to talk about the ethos of the church, not just the the technical things, the, the doctrinal statement, but but kind of how we are, who we are as a family, the family dynamic, um, our commitments to one another, our commitments to unity, um, to explain what what we mean by gospel culture and, and what we're wanting to walk in together. Because if someone is looking to join the church and beat some drum about an issue that is not important for every believer. Um, it's a way of giving them a heads up. You, you probably just won't feel at home here. Mm -hmm. So there's a sense in which the membership scheme can protect the church mm -hmm. from people who actually might be destructive if they, if they joined it. Yes. You, I'm sure would be more diplomatic about that than I ever was, but I did, Tried to, I tried not to be discourteous, but I was pretty clear in, in our membership seminars. And I, I thought of our membership seminars as kind of like orientation week for a freshman at university. Hmm. Um, here's how we roll. Here's how it works. Here's how this can be great for you and so forth. But I would also say, uh, if, if, this, if you need um, a platform for your political agenda or whatever it might be. Um, we just don't do that around here. Yeah. I would never use the word you, like you won't fit in because that would sound belittling and accusing. I would use the word we, mm. talk about ourselves. We just don't do that around here. Here's how we roll mm. and just describe gospel culture in concrete and lovely terms. And I found people really responded to that because... Yeah. Um, it, not this, but that sort of almost like before and after picture. Uh, most people, if if gospel culture is described in a way that every weekly sermon, for example, just can't do, mm -hmm. but the membership seminar is like orientation week for the whole experience. Yeah. It's a golden opportunity to disciple every new wave of members yeah. in this glorious reality we love to call gospel culture. And it's a way of, of explaining what it means to how we steward one another's honesty yes, as a church. That's a good point. If someone shares something, we don't throw that back at them. Yeah. Uh, Jesus doesn't use sin we've repented of to condemn us. Yes. So as we confess sins together in this place, we part of what it means to be at this church is that we really honor that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a way of estab establishing, I guess, some of the ground rules. That's not the best way of putting it. Yeah, well, we but know it, what you mean. Yeah. But it gives it gives people a chance to think, okay, I, actually, I really do want to be part of that. And they're making a conscious commitment to that. It also gives us something to hold one another to should the, the time arise where we need to say something if someone is behaving in a way that is seriously undermining that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think it can really help to have a, a church membership scheme. Um, and when I was lead pastor, I always led the new member seminars because mm -hmm. I wanted the people satisfied. They had gotten to know me. Yeah, they had had direct and personal exposure to me, and they had had an opportunity to, to ask me any question they they might want. And I always said, "Our Q and A times here. Here are the ground rules: one, the harder the question, the better; the more embarrassing the question, the more fun." <laughs> <laughs> um, someone has asked. We they have um, appreciated sort of being introduced to Schaefer through the the podcast. Um, are there other Good examples from church history of, of people who seem to embody what we mean by gospel culture. How about you, Sam? What would you identify? Well, I was thinking about this, and um, the, the danger of recommending anyone is that obviously that person has flaws, so we're not sort of saying everything they did was was perfect. But I've 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 always found I I feel like one of my one of the guys who would be my buddy is Hudson Taylor. Hmm. if we were around at the same time, because as I've looked at his life and his ministry, he seemed to be someone who obviously was so committed to the gospel, so willing to put everything on the line for it, so willing to suffer yes, and to be embarrassed back in his home country by his commitment to the gospel. But he struck me as someone who was fun to be around. Hmm. Um. Okay, for those of us who don't know, what would be his Hudson Taylor's approximate dates? So he founded the what was then the China Inland Mission in 1865. Um, so I can't remember his date of 
birth or his date of death but that was sort of that was the beginning of his of that mission organization under his leadership so that that's the sort of time we're talking about but i had an opportunity uh, uh, when i graduated um from seminary one of my treats to myself was to spend a day at the hudson taylor archives oh interesting at the school of oriental and african studies in london wow where all of his stuff is archived and i i had a few hours um and access to his letters so i read letters from around 1865 when he was forming the china inland mission much of it was formed on the hoof it was stuff on the back of an envelope as he was on a boat somewhere in deep inside china but a lot of the, the letters to his wife maria were so edifying so affectionate um mm. again you got the the sense he he was someone who wanted people to feel to feel loved to feel known yes um to feel encouraged in the lord and he just seemed to have a good sense of humor too that reminds me of charles Haddon spurgeon um, mm. there's a paragraph in one of his it may have been lectures to my students where he describes a pastor as sort of like a bay or an inlet where ships can come in hmm. and be sheltered from the surging waves further out at sea. They can come in and rest and be safe. Hmm. And he said a pastor wants to have as big, create as big a bay as he possibly can for as many ships to come as and be safe and rest hmm. and rethink life and so forth. And that is a beautiful image to me yes. of a pastor this is this is talking about a pastor interacting with people face to face after the sermon is and is completed the service is over he's meeting people for the first time he's seeing old friends as well he's having a lot of rapid fire interactions mm -hmm. right you know how it goes and in each one the pastor is alert to the moment and sincerely feeling affection and care for each person as an individual. And his heart is large enough for those people to come in and be enclosed and mm. made safe and included. That kind of big-hearted pastor. Yeah. That, that sort of personality, that sort of sincerity and selflessness and mm. others' awareness, that sensitivity at the heart of a church, that has power. Hmm. to set the tone of the entire church. Wow. I love that. Um, here's the, the final question we've got. How, how do you deal with criticism? What is a gospel culture way of coping with criticism? Hmm. Wow. Just in case any pastor at some point ever receives criticism. That you know, happens. That, that could one day happen to someone. Really? Huh. Interesting. I, I guess I heard about that once yeah. somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> what would you say, Sam? I think that there are probably a few things to do all at the same time. One is to think through, is there some, is there a good point in the criticism? In other words, is it a fair criticism? And here's the thing, there may be a fair criticism that is being expressed really unfairly. Mm -hmm. So the unfairness of the expression doesn't mean there's not a good point in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. So even if the person is, is being insensitive or intemperate or something like that, it's always worth asking the question, even so, do they have a point? I mean, really, do they have a point? Second thing, whether the answer to that is yes or no, we're always far worse than they actually think we are. That's a good point. So let, let's not be resentful that someone might criticise us because actually, even if, even if the criticism is unfair, the fact remains, I'm still far worse than they think I am. Mm -hmm. I mean, really. Um, and I guess not to, not to take it personally, even if it's meant personally, is to think, okay, and Second Timothy's helps with this because even where he's talking about people who might be opposing you or needing correction, there's always that, that dimension of compassion for them, wanting what is going to be a good spiritual outcome for that person. So even if they're coming at me with, with fists, you know, flailing around and all the rest of it, how might the Lord use this interaction to be a spiritual win for their life? That's really good. So rather than how can I, you know, just defend myself, 
is is there a way I could help them in this? I think, Sam, I think, Sam, there is a, do you, do you realize, do you realize what you just said? There is a nobility about you that is very striking. I didn't say I'd do all of that. <laughs> I just said, that's what I feel like I, I, I should do in that, in that moment. Well, I understand. Yeah. Here's, and let me, uh, this is crazy. Uh, let me propose this. We should seek out criticism. Yeah. In this sense, there is no growth without feedback. Yeah. No one grows without feedback. My dad used to say, every man who wants to grow in Christ and bear fruit and go somewhere needs one or two, maybe three, close, trusted friends with whom he meets Hmm. on a regular basis, not every two or three years, and to whom that man says, help me see myself. Help me see myself. That is the magic question. Mm. New avenues of growth open up when we have the humility and honesty to say that to guys we really trust. Yeah. You don't say that to just anybody. Yeah. But to a Sam Alberry in my life, how could I not say that? So if if a pastor is unwilling to pull toward his heart and into mm. his life, into his intimacy, trustworthy, mature friends to whom he can say, help me see myself. I'll tell you, that pastor who is so isolated and insecure Hmm. five years from now there's a good chance he won't even be in ministry anymore Hmm. maybe two years from now what path are we moving down Hmm. all the time two things strike me about that ray one i you've said that to me many times what am i not seeing in myself and one of the things that i've i so appreciate about you asking some of us that question is you're in your early 70s mid nearly 70s you're not presuming you've you've got a handle on yourself yet you're not presuming you've kind of yeah of course i know where my strengths and weaknesses are you're you're assuming there are still things in yourself you might not be aware of yeah. that that could be relevant in ministry the other thing that strikes me about that is it's going to happen one way or the other yeah that's true do you want the controlled explosion hmm. when you're ready for it or the uncontrolled explosion when you're not ready for it that's a great point so if you can be thinking, okay, here's a time and a place where I can feel emotionally ready <laughs> with a trusted friend, where it's going to be a constructive process. Hey, I might, you know, might be a difficult conversation. It's never going to be fun having that that conversation, but it can help you grow and learn and move forwards. Better to have it done that way through a friend who's got his arm around you at the time yes. than someone who's just trying to tear strips off you. And if it's mutual, yes, everyone it, in that circle is saying the same thing. Yeah, and it has to be mutual, doesn't yes. it? Otherwise, right. it just doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> That's part of what makes me trust someone to, to give me feedback on myself yeah. is that it's a, it is a two-way thing. If that were to go viral among Christian pastors in the UK, in the USA, and elsewhere, this kind of vulnerability, transparency, humility, and openness with one another Mm. mutually in small groups of two, three, and four men. Mm. That might be the very thing to detonate the third great awakening. We would all go further with the Lord than we've ever gone before, further than we've ever dreamed of going. Mm. The Lord would honor that. Sam, thank you for um, letting me be involved in this podcast. Thank you. Oh, gosh, Ray. uh, I'm so grateful to you. Uh, we're grateful to our listeners and our friends. And uh, maybe the best way to end this, Sam, is for you just to pray for us all. Would you do that? I would love to. Father, any any ministry in any context for you is is a privilege uh, and it's something we we don't deserve to do, but we somehow get to do. And we pray particularly for, for those who are serving in their local congregations as as pastors as leaders as elders Uh, father please encourage every single one of us encourage us in christ would he be an encouragement to us as we keep looking to him father i pray that every single one of us would have two or three really trusted friends that we can be open with friends who who can say occasionally difficult things to us friends that we can be honest with, uh, friends who will stand by us in our ministries. Father, what a 
gift that is. Um, please help each of us to seek that out. Not to be above needing it, uh, not to be fearful of it. And Father, we've, we've talked about our longings for a, another great awakening. We, we so long that the goodness and sweetness of Jesus would go viral. Uh, Father, we don't want that to happen in a way that makes us look self-important and ahead of the curve and, and all the rest of it. We, we just long for Jesus uh, to be made known. So we pray that he would be, and may we be forgotten. Mm -hmm. And we pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Ray, who else is in the room with us right now? Well, Andrew Lapara is right over here, technical genius. And Darius, what's your last name, Darius? Darius Kennedy. And these two guys have quietly behind the scenes served us. And then Becca is in the next room. What is Becca's last name? Warren. Becca Warren? She has been this most cheerful presence looking out after us in, in, in very kind and de delightful ways. So, guys, thank you so much. All the listeners are grateful for you. Yeah, we're so grateful to TGC for, for helping us to have a podcast. Um, very kind of them to, to host this and to, to support that. Uh, we're grateful, as always, um, to Crossway. And um, as always, we want to, to highlight good examples of, of their work. And I'm trying to find the list I have. Of <laughs> Paul Tripp. <laughs> Paul Tripp's book, um, Reactivity. I'm just looking for the subtitle. Um, Reactivity. Reactivity. What does he mean by that? Um, here it is. Reactivity, how the gospel transforms our actions and reactions. Now, you endorsed this book, I didn't endorsed you? this book. So it's been a while since I've read it. It came out uh, back end of last year. It's a, it's a shorter book. Paul is looking at, he's particularly looking at the phenomenon of why do we react the way we do, particularly in, in context like social media. Oh, There's this okay. sort of reflexive impulse yeah. that is often a little bit awry. So um, being a Paul Tripp book, it is practical it is infused with the gospel uh, it is written paul just knows our hearts because he knows his own heart um so that's a book we would love to we would love to commend it will help us to be wiser in the words that we use in the ways that we respond um to, to people around us we're, we're so grateful to, to paul for his his writing ministry and we're grateful to crossway for their their support of this podcast and to you, dear friends, for, for listening and for, for bearing with us over these episodes of this season. Um, thanks to those of you who, who come and say hi to us when, when we're out and about. And you, uh, it's, it's always a joy to meet people who, who listen to this. God bless you.